I work primarily with diversified organic farmers in Maine and have for the past 15 years or so. And um, we have generally very good relationships with them, uh, lots of programming in terms of field days and co collaborations at meetings. Um, but I was really intrigued when I got invited to participate with the Mental Models Project to try to understand more deeply how these farmers think about weeds and weed management. Um, my program focused on the three northern New England states of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and we sampled, or we interviewed 23 farmers, so this is basically another region. Sarah was in charge of, Sarah and her group was in charge of the Midwest. We did northern New England, so uh, 12 farms in Maine, five in New Hampshire, six in Vermont, and these were primarily uh, small to mid-scale diversified organic vegetable farmers, so say two to 15 or 20 acres, as well as, uh, and there were 19 of these, and then we had four that would be considered more field crop or uh, this is Jack Laser in northern Vermont here checking a, a, a winter wheat crop, or, and then uh, a few dairy farmers as well. Um, and we went out to these farms in the uh, fall of 2010, and uh, in as uh, Sarah already described, an overview and, and quite a bit more detail of the mental models modeling project. In our region, Katie McPhee was in charge of conducting the interviews, so we had the same, as you can see, very bright, cheery person uh, interviewing these farmers. The interviews would take one and a half to two hours, and then uh, the transcripts were made, and then they all went to Sarah, who did the incredible job of actually coding all of these interviews. Uh, so that that's the, the interview portion, and I won't really go into that in any more detail. Sarah already covered that. So we have now the the uh, coded interview data from 23 farms and these great transcripts and very interesting quotes. In addition to the interviews in the spring of that year, so actually before we conducted the uh, interviews, we visited each of the 23 farms and we collected... Uh, soil samples from five fields on each farm. And this was to characterize the, the weed seed banks on the farm. And we call this a germinable seed bank assay, where basically we go to a field. Uh, in this case, we selected about a 10 square meter section in the center of the chosen field, and we would take 10 soil cores, oh, about um, uh, three and a half inch diameter core to a depth of about four inches, uh, 10 centimeters. And, um, and we would pool these 10 cores, bring them back to the greenhouse, spread them in a flat on top of some vermiculite to hold water. And then um, basically over the next uh, eight months or so, exhaustively germinate uh, the, the, the weed seeds out of the soil. And this is a very good way to characterize uh, weed communities and the relative abundance of each species. And you can see some of the great diversity in the weed communities of some of our um, uh, mental models participating farmers. And then as a reference, that same year I also sampled uh, Eric and Ann Nordell's farm in, in, in North uh, central Pennsylvania. Some of you may have heard of them, and you can see the very low seed bank evident in this sample from their farm. Um, the seed bank data proved to be very interesting. It, it, there was quite a wide range on our 23 organic farms in New England, from a low of 2,800, and, and that would be in farm one here, up to a high of of, um, of 28,000 uh, uh, average over here. And what we see is um, that 
most of the farms were in this uh, medium category that I would say is between 2,500 and 10,000 or so germinable seeds per square meter. Uh, and then we had actually seven that I would consider in a very high category of above 10,000 germinable seeds per square meter. And the reason that we're interested in seed banks is that, uh, well, just a quick overview. In, in, in contrast to Northern Europe where organic farmers primarily have problems with perennial weeds, in our growing areas in the Midwest and in, North, in New England, uh, we do have some perennial weed problems, but most of the weed problems continue to be annuals. And the density of seedlings that a farmer is attempting to manage in a given year is directly proportional to the density of seeds in the soil. And so it's not, it's really quite simple. You start out with fewer seeds, you have fewer seedlings. And then when you cultivate, for example, you kill, say, 60% of the seedlings that are there, and so you have 40% surviving. And if you have 40% of a very small number, that may be perfectly acceptable. But if you're only killing 40% of a very large number, you have to cultivate repeatedly. And so for these farmers that are in this high category, their weed problems are certainly stable, if not increasing over time. Whereas when you're down here, you can actually keep on top of the weed problem and things will stay the same or actually get better over time. The two most abundant species in this data set were uh, large crabgrass and hairy gallon soga. So these would be considered the most problematic species in, in, in this um, study. And uh, uh, as a first overview, I'd like to just sort of ask the question and show you a little bit about how we're relating then some of the interview data to this weed seed bank data set. And the central question is how do, you know, more or less how do the interview results or, or our coding relate to the weed pressure we measured on these farms? In other words, can we detect a difference or a, a relationship between farmers' weed management philosophies and their weed pressure or weed seed banks? Um, so to do this, we've basically done some uh, correlation and regression analyses looking at our weed seed bank density. And you can see here that scale from zero to upwards of 25,000 germinable seeds per square meter. Uh, and this first example demonstrates uh, that as um, uh, the number of mentions of risks goes up, the weed seed bank declines. And so overall, farmers with less weed pressure considered weeds to be more ris risky, or in their interviews, they mentioned the risks of weeds more frequently. So risks such as agricultural, economic, or social risks. Um, the agricultural risks were the most important in this particular um, analysis. So risks such as competition, there'd be a lot of codes of people, of farmers talking about competition, plant characteristics, uh, weeds mining of mining nutrients, weeds interfering with harvest, and so on. And so uh, on the other hand, farmers that might have talked about you know, sort of the benefits of weeds, they would, as you might expect, have higher densities. Uh, the next example this is really quite a large coding category, which was the no farmer's knowledge of ecological weed management. Uh, and as you can see, this time, instead of looking at the entire seed bank, we're looking at the proportion of problematic weeds, in sp specifically what proportion of the total seed bank is made up of, of gallon soga and crabgrass. And so you, you can see that farmers that discussed or exhibited uh, you know, lower levels of knowledge of ecological weed management 
tended to have higher proportions of these really difficult to manage species. And as the knowledge of ecological weed management increased, there was a corresponding decline then in the, the, the proportion of these problem species. Uh, the, the particular knowledge categories, about half of these in this case were things that we would categorize as understanding agroecology. Uh, and then the other half of the codes would have been made up of, of things like uh, recognizing opportunities to manage weeds, use of multiple weed management tactics, and managing the weed seed bank. Uh, another uh, relationship we looked at that basically we did to try to make ourselves feel good, uh, we the expert weed ecology types, uh, we looked at um, the knowledge codes that farmers discussed uh, and their, the, the number that agreed with the experts and uh, then we have here again the weed seed bank density on the y-axis and uh, quite pleasing to me anyways was the fact that as farmers discussed or presented uh, information that was in agreement with experts they tend to have a uh, lower weed pressure um, and in addition, we looked at the category of other codes. These would be things like uh, indicator weeds, uh, uh, fertility management to control weeds, uh, longevity of seeds in the soil. Uh, and there was really no relationship between some of these other uh, knowledge codes and the seed bank. So uh, even though these might be influencing farmers, decision making it doesn't we, we can't detect uh, uh, necessarily a benefit here so uh, just to summarize this first uh, part relating the weed seed bank or the more broadly the weed pressure on our participating farms with uh, their mental models we we show that um, farmers with less weed pressure are aware of and mention more risks of weeds they demonstrate more knowledge of ecological weed management and they also learn from diverse sources and I didn't really get into this part of the data set but they put a uh, as Sarah had mentioned earlier they put a, a great emphasis on learning and knowledge from trial and error um, in addition to trying to figure out well how does knowledge uh, relate to weed pressure on farms, we also wanted to look at the differences between the expert and the farmer models. And the, the principal aim here was to, you know, by identifying these differences, we could figure out how to um, improve our communication with farmers, improve our educational programming, and perhaps um, offer us some priorities for new research projects and I'll discuss two of them here Sarah mentioned uh, the first one that was the most important one in our data set which was um, really close to home for me and that is weed seed banks and so there was a notable difference between you know farmers mental models related to weed seed banks and the, the researchers um, this is, like I said, pretty close to home for me because this is the core area of my research program and I've been doing lectures at farmer meetings about managing weed seed banks for the past 15 years or so. Um, and when we look at some of the interview transcripts about farmer seed bank beliefs, we see a lot of quotes like this, I'm fighting somebody else's weed that they left 40 years ago. Oh, mustard, they're good for 80 years. Velvet leaf, 40 years. Ragweed, oh yeah, something like 70 years in the soil or something crazy like that. Um, and as I read these and, and this information started to come through, I, I started to realize that indeed I was really part of the problem 
it, it was always kind of common for me to introduce the concept of the seed banks, even perhaps with more extreme examples, like examples from the archaeological site where common land supporters that were over 1,500 or 1,000 years old were still viable. That's that catchy, catchy, and thought I was, thought I was using them to sort of engage my audience. Well, well. What was happening by focus on this kind of, you know, one year, year, seven years, seven years, seven years, and these sorts of things. Is that, is that, um, we, we get farmers to think about, about the persistence of seeds in the soil. And so, so this, this diagram represents the, the exponential decline of weed seeds. So when, when weed seeds enter the weed seed bank, um, Assuming that we don't have any additional seed rain from that species, they decline exponentially like this. And what you see is that there's a, a, a rapid drop initially, and then the proportional decline starts to slow. And we do have some seeds that last a very long time, but most seeds do not. And it's the most seeds that we're attempting to manage because we're managing for density of weeds. We're not managing to completely um, uh, eliminate a species. Uh, we're not trying to make something go extinct. We just want very low numbers. And so uh, the farmers and researchers, we have the same mental model for weed seed banks, but we focus on two very different parts of it. I think about helping farmers think about how they can manage to have a rapid decline over the first couple of years. The half-lives of many of our important agricultural weeds are actually less than a year and a half. So if you can prevent seed rain, you experience you know, a half of a 50% you know, reduction in one year. Meanwhile, while I'm presenting this information and trying to talk to farmers about managing their weed seed banks by preventing seed rain or maximizing uh, debits of the seed bank by germination or, or predation, farmers are focused on this area and they're sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, doesn't that ecologist dude even know that the seeds last forever in the soil? So this has been a real uh, eye-opener for me, and it, and it um, is really a, a illustrative, I think, of how valuable this sort of mental models approach, the social science, and as well as uh, uh, ecological approach to understanding organic farmers is. Uh, we're basically now trying to figure out, well, how do we engage farmers in this particular topic and then get them to think about the fact that, well, yes, a few seeds last a long time, but most do not. So we're working on some, some animated videos and some, some small, some fact sheets that attempt to engage farmers with where they are in terms of their thinking and get them to consider this alternative model. Uh, the second large incongruity between farmers and experts, uh, again, as Sarah had mentioned, was related to weeds as indicator species or fertility effects on weeds. This is something that uh, researchers don't discuss very much beyond, say, nitrogen. You know, we uh, experts would talk about banding nitrogen fertilizer trying to uh, selectively deliver it to a crop instead of a weed, but not so much about uh, weeds as an indicator of poor uh, management and that if you simply correct the management, you will uh, make these weeds go away. Uh, so this is an, er an example of a, of a difference between the farmer and expert mental models where we really need to do some more research. Uh, and Basically, that's where we're going with this, trying to engage some of the um, people, some of the consultants who work in this area and work with them to design some field experiments to demonstrate some of these uh, practices. Um, so I guess I'm going to stop there and rec I just want to sort of recognize the fantastic uh, 
uh, organic farmers in northern New England who contributed to this uh, effort. They were just fabulous to host us on their farms uh, and leave you with uh, a little bit of advertising from my own program. Uh, we've got quite a lot of uh, practical um, weed management uh, information in a video series on a number of topics, a lot related to physical weed control at our YouTube channel, which is called Zero Seed Rain.